I was 16 years old when my mom said to me one day that life as you know it has is over. The entire empire that was created had come crashing down. The whole point of running a business is so you can leave a legacy. In the year 2000, late 2000, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And then about three years later, it happened again. So okay. I had to give myself another break. And that's when I decided, okay, that's it. I'm not gonna allow this to stop me from doing what I really want to do. And always upskill people, you can train people. There are three areas in business, strategy, marketing, and economics. They're all a mind game, all through. If we are the smartest people in the room, then we're in the wrong room. And that's equally true in your own business as well. There is no such thing as being your own boss when you start a business. And that's where, when that reality starts to hit in, is where the disillusionment comes in. Welcome to the Forward Thinking People, a podcast on dreamers, the go-getters, and the leaders who never give up. From groundbreaking startups to established enterprises, we uncover the stories behind their success that can inspire us to think differently, adapt to change, and embrace innovation. Whether you're an inspiring entrepreneur, seasoned business owner, or simply curious about the future of work and entrepreneurship, tune into our podcast and be part of this journey as we challenge the status quo, spark meaningful conversations, and empower you to navigate the landscape of business with confidence and foresight. Today, we are speaking with Varsha Joshi, the Managing Director of Dare to Scale and a seasoned business strategy advisor to founders and CEOs across the Middle East and North Africa. Varsha brings over four decades of experience in building and scaling businesses, having successfully grown multiple ventures to seven-figure revenues and achieving noteworthy ex exits. Her expertise extends to advising family businesses on next-gen succession by navigating the intricate family dynamics and preparing them for sustainable growth or exit. Under her leadership, one of her primary businesses was recognized as one of the MENA region's top 10 great places to work, reflecting her ability to create thriving workplace cultures. Varsha holds degrees in economics and business administration and is a certified professional business scaling mentor and master practitioner of NLP. Her laser sharp listening skills and no-nonsense communication styles makes her a master at simplifying complex issues and navigating, rather negotiating, powerful outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Varsha Joshi to the Forward Thinking People podcast. Varsha, Hello. it is such a pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs> I was listening to everything that you were reading and I thought, wow, you've really done your research. <laughs> But thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. pleasure to be here. Research is a part of the of the show, right? If I, I don't know see. the guest, how do I know how to dig deeper into him you or bet. her? So I am going to put on my glasses. That will help me read. Yes. My research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's part Should of I aging, I guess. Glasses? I'm not reading anything. Today, my role is to talk. <laughs> yes. I would love for us <clears throat> to start mm -hmm. with you sharing us your journey on Dare to Scale. Okay. So before I start with Dare to Scale, I'd like to share how I even got into doing what I do. Mm -hmm. I was 16 years old when my mom said to me one day that life as you know it has, is over. At 16? At 16. Okay. My li life as I knew it was over around 12, when I was 12 years of age. <clears throat> but at 16, my mom said, life as we know it is over. Doesn't life start at 16? I know, that's what you think. <laughs> Mine didn't. But in a way, my, did, my life actually did start at 16. Just life as I knew it was over. The fun child, like life, you're becoming an adult? <laughs> is yes. that what you mean? Yes. So I'm third generation into a family business. <laughs> and my grandfather... Um, founded a fairly large empire. And why I do what I do is because when he found his successor, he didn't do a great deal to train the successor to do a successful handover. 
So by the time I was 16, the entire empire that was created had come crashing down. But wouldn't you this, you had <coughs> siblings? Did I have one? Did you, do, are you, do you have siblings? I do. I have two older sisters. So doesn't the family business come to the children? No, because you see, in those days, it didn't go to girls. Ah, oh. I know. <laughs> Complexities. It went to the boys of the family. Um, yes, and well, such a long story. But basically, what had happened was everything had come crashing down. And we didn't have anywhere to live. Wow. I know. From uh, having such a big business <coughs> to not having anywhere to live. To not having anywhere to live. To not having anything in our pockets to buy our next meal. What did, the, whatever, what did that person do, whoever took over <laughs> the business? <laughs> no, nobody took over the business. That is a sad part. And this ah. is why f the complexities of family businesses hit me really hard that day. And I thought, wow. So... It's not just about starting a business and running it. It's about how you find your successor and how you train your successor and how you put some mechanisms in place within your business so it succeeds and it continues to run even with the new successor in place is what is more important. But at then, that time when you were 16, when all of this happened, you didn't know you are <coughs> going to be doing this, right? No, I didn't know anything about it. So... Clearly, and in those days, you protect the child as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't told a great deal of anything that was happening. And when I was told, I was told like this. So my mom, my dad, and I rented a sh shop front. It was literally a shop front with shutters and things. Okay. And we borrowed 500 rupees. I'm going way back in 1986. We borrowed 500 rupees. And I had just finished, as you would in those days, a beauty therapist course. And my mom said, well, that's a skill at hand. We're going to have to do something with this. I said, okay, what shall we do? So in that 500 rupees, we managed rent. And we managed to set up such a rudimentary setup for a little salon. And my parents had warned me that, look, even doctors start a practice and then nobody shows up for months. So we prepared for it. And I thought, okay, well, thanks. And yet I have no idea what we're getting into. But we opened doors on 28th of August. 1986. Mm -hmm. And the same day somebody walked in and it was as simple as, oh, could you do my eyebrows? And I said, yeah, sure. And I charged five rupees. That day, my parents and I said, that's great. You're we can business. buy a meal for ourselves. <laughs> so I usually say, if I ever write a book on my life, it would be called Five Rupees, <laughs> because that's how it started. Yeah. But what became so apparent to me was, <clears throat> excuse me, when a business is started, it is not just okay to start a business. You've got to understand the mechanics of business. You've got to understand the intricacies, the nuances of running a business. So you have a great product, but if you don't know how to run a business, there's very little point in the impact that you're creating right now. The whole point of running a business is so you can leave a legacy. And that's how my life started at the age of 16. Believe me, Namita, my mom took me under her wing. My mom's even today ever the entrepreneur. I learned more about business from her than anyone else. And we've never looked back since then. That's how my life started. So that's why I do what I do. That's if, you, if you're looking for the background of how I got into Dare to Scale, it, the story starts it over there. But you also had an option to do a job somewhere. Yes, I had an option. But then why did you guys choose to start a business again? Because none of us knew how to hold a job because nobody in my family has ever held a job. You come Running from the business, business background. Exactly. That's yeah. all we know. Yeah. So any time, if ever there was a time that we had to restart, starting a business is the only way our brain works. Both mm -hmm. my sisters and I, they both run a very, very successful businesses of their own. But that's all we knew. There was no question of holding a job because we had no idea how to get a job, how to hold a job. It's interesting. When you come from a family background of yeah. businesses, it's like... 
same here. Like I come from a business background and I cannot, I don't know how, like I would not no. be a good employee. No. I don't know, but I'd I know. I'd be a useless employee. <laughs> I really would be. Or we don't know. Employee. Maybe we would be the best and eventually make our own business out of it also. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> because we are so go-getters or something. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. And because make a it's out just, of it. and it's quite natural. But the, whenever I look at any establishment, the first thing I look at is, well, great product. But how is the mechanisms work behind the scenes? So business is like playing chess. I don't play chess, having said that. Full disclaimer, I don't play chess. But what my mother taught me was, yes, it's like playing chess. It's about what is strategy. It's about knowing what you're going to do, thinking 10 steps ahead. So being able to read people, being able to understand people's psychology, and knowing what you need to be doing to get the result that you want so that you're getting that positive impact that you're looking for is what strategy is, but thinking 10 steps ahead. Have you seen a game of snooker? I have. The other day, uh, I was watching this game. Uh, there was some tournament going on. I have never seen. Yeah. I, I've played pool in in past, but uh, my husband happened to put snooker on television, and mm -hmm. it was amazing. You it have is. to think ten step ahead. Yeah. Because you have to place your ball so yeah. that you have the exactly. next. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, to roll. Exactly. And so what happens if you strike a ball over there and that one moves out of the way? So how are we opening up? the other doors yeah for the other door for ourselves yeah. or if you happen to open a door and you get out of the game what doors are you leaving open for somebody else to come in exactly so so many lessons from the snooker it is from the game of snooker you bet it is so how did you from say from the <coughs> salon how did the life move forward how did you start all your other ventures the, the salon interestingly just took off thankfully i was really good at what i did mm -hmm. and uh, the salon took off and very soon I started an institute as well because I continued my own training along with that. So I went to the UK. I was in the UK for three years. Um, while the salon was run, learning, I was upgrading, upskilling myself. And I came back and I started an institute where we were training um, our own certification along with what it was one of the only institutes in the entire southern India to train uh, professionals for uh, Cidesco qualification. Cidesco is the highest qualification in within the industry. Okay. So we just took on the license and I started the institute. And we ran it for a good eleven years. And I say when I say we, mom was also around. So she still is around. She was actually within the business, yes. So I ran it for about eleven years. And as it happens, and you will notice I'll mention my mom quite a bit over here because she's been a massive influence in my life. And I was all of 26, 27 at that time. And it was quite successful. I ventured into professional makeup. I stayed in Mumbai for quite a while. And in that entire scenario, mom being mom, she says, well, you do remember, you can't stop your education. So I went ahead and got my economics degree along with running the salon. And there came a time when I was all set up. I had a great house. I'd actually bought my flat. I had a car. People would recognize me from my number plate where I was in the city. And my mom looked at me one day and she says, you know, you're 26. Don't you think you're too young to have it all? And I thought, well, <laughs> again, thanks. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Where's this coming from? always challenged you. She did, and she yeah. always has. And she says, well, you did all this so we can settle. Now I want you to go and start your life so you can find out what life is like and settle in yourself, okay? And I want you to leave India because the way you are now, you're not somebody who can live here. You've changed and you're, the expectations from society are not something that you're going to be able to cope with. Mm -hmm. So have you ever thought of leaving India? <laughs> not until now, but okay, <laughs> keep talking. And somebody was looking for um, a consultant to help set up a salon here in Dubai. And I came here for three months and it's been 27 years. That's what Dubai does to you. That's what Dubai Once does. Once you come I here, know. you can't leave the place. You don't know how three months turns to yeah. half a decade. So yeah. just, and now we're here. <laughs> but yes, and, and I went back uh, about three years later and we sold the salon and the institute together. And 
in those days, it was one of the biggest sales in the in entire southern four states. Did so you have a plan, an exit strategy for the salon? No. Not intentionally, so. no. And now, if I were to start that all over again, I would do it slightly differently. It was a good thing that it, the credibility was so high that we had offers coming in. And today, I would possibly look at how this would run, even without me, but even after a sale, how would that entire ethos still continue? Of course, yeah, cause there's only so much you can control once a, once a sale has happened, because then it's up to the buyer. Yeah. But I'd probably do it a little bit differently. But no, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. But then once I knew I was here to stay, and I thought I got to give it a proper, proper outcome. Okay. So, so what did you then, you set up a new company <coughs> in Dubai, of course? I did. I did over here. Um, in the meantime, I had several health issues, so I had to give myself time to cope with it. And at some point, if you want, I can talk about that. But the point is... Please, I, go ahead if you would like to share. Well, as it happened, in the year 2000, late 2000, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so I had to take a little bit of a break. And yes, I did actually take a little part-time job at that time <laughs> because... I was just mentally tired, yeah, and I had no idea where that came from. So, um, and then about three years later, it happened again. So okay. I had to give myself another break, and that's when I decided, okay, that's it. I'm not going to allow this to stop me from doing what I really want to do. So that was the day I decided, I finished my treatments over, and I'm going to do what I actually. I'm good at doing. So that's when I set up my next business, which, which is still running, by the way. Data is scale? No platinum consultancies. Right. So that still runs. It's, that's the one that you said in the intro, the great places to work. Oh, I yeah. would love to talk about that. How did you manage to get that? Like, how, does, how do you get <clears throat> the honor of being the great place to work for? Well, it's a... It's an institution, so you actually ask them to come and audit your company. Okay. And I, I was determined, that was very intentional. I was determined that I want to be featured in The Great Place to Work because for me, having great people within your company, nurturing them, nurturing their talent, making them feel like they are not just working for a company but they're actually part of this yeah, company the absolutely. entire success depend their success the company's success is interwoven always absolutely and well before richard branson ever said my mom had said to me she said no matter what you do in life look after your people because your business will come and go your clients will come and go it's your people who will stay yeah. forever with you I so that. no matter what look after your people and that became my mantra forever so I thought, well, how about I actually get some validation with this? Surely there's a way to find out. Yeah. But on. I would like to ask <clears throat> to, uh, of course, being honored by great places to work with is fantastic. Yeah. But you need to have a great place to work with yes. to be certified, right? Yes. So what are the, these things you did? Like one, one is to attract amazing talent to your company. Amazing people. Amazing people to your company. Second is to... Keep everything, everyone yes. motivated to do yes. their best, to feel yes. part of it, to be yeah. one with the company and the company's goal. Yeah. There's so many dynamics around people. Massive dynamics. And I'll add another dynamic to it. While everybody was geographically based over here, it was a fully remote working scenario. Back in the year you're talking about? Since we started. This is... A, 20, 2008. 2008, there was no concept of remote there was working no then. Concept. So when the pandemic came around, <laughs> I had literally done a video to say, welcome to our world. <laughs> Suddenly now everybody works from home, but we've been doing it for so long. Yeah. And how did I do this differently? It, attracting great talent comes second. Attracting great people first. Because you can always upskill people, you can train people, but you can't change who they are. So for me, hiring for culture was not just a line in our induction book. We actually lived it. From day one, that was my goal. Was if I love somebody, if I know, if I see them fitting into the company, I would teach them what they want to know. If 
but I need people who see this and see why we do what we do and actually love being in the company that we are creating, being each other's support system. So we, we took a great deal of um, effort in hiring great people. So the, even the way we interviewed was very different. It How wasn't it? a 10 minute interview. So it was close to an hour's conversation and then an actual integrated session for half a day when we would bring the person over and when we go out for a meal or have a few uh, buddies within the team come and just have a social event and get this, get the new person to really interact to see how do they feel about being with us. And then we would go into another round of conversations and we never called it interviews. We still don't. They're rounds of conversations. But they're all still working from their own homes. They are. Okay. They are. Mm. They are working from their own homes. But, but the beauty are. is, it, when we come together, it was like we have always been working together in the same room. And that's a level of chemistry that I was looking to develop within every single person. Every single day, every single morning before setting up to work. There, and it, working from home doesn't come easy for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So we actually brought in that culture to say, how it, it doesn't matter whether you're working from home, actually dress for work. Wake up, finish your routine, send your child off to school, dress for work, have your setup, and actually greet your team like you would when you come into work. So we had private WhatsApp groups, we had private virtual boards. And so there was, there was a lot of constant engagement. The focus was on client delivery, yes, but a great deal more on engagement. Tell us what's happening in your life. So it is, we at one point, we even always knew if somebody's child was, has sneezed in school and wanted support. There's a lot of personal engagement with the team. Incredibly. What was one of the biggest challenge? of having a remote team? Getting most people used to the fact that even though they're working from home, they're not alone. Because most people think if I'm working from home, I'm by myself. And they're never by themselves. The other so, colleague is just one chat away, yeah. one message away. You're one message call away. away. You're one call away. And there was enough mechanics within the team where there was a constant support system offered for everybody. Everybody had a buddy for six months at a time and the buddies were changed. So there was always mm -hmm. someone holding their hand. And there came a time when I said, I was determined to do it within 10 years of setup. So I actually asked Bright Place to Work to come and audit us. Did a full on audit, full audit. And we of course came out quite well through the whole thing and we even have a letter from them to say that despite all the companies that they they audit some of our scores were in the high 90s and says it's impossible that a small company can do this and I thought well thank you that's great and to our surprise it's a year later when they do the the summary of the entire 12 months is when it showed up that we were number eight in the Middle East wow congratulations thank you that was quite a surprise. That that happened in the middle of middle of the pandemic, and but the the fact is, it happened. And I thought, well, I'm glad. Yeah. Thank you to the team. We <laughs> of course had a great celebration after of that. Of course, <laughs> yeah. But it was it's quite an amazing. the The point of saying this is, many people today work from home. Many people work remotely. Many companies work remotely. That's no reason to allow team engagement to fall in any way because it's possible to keep the team together, just as you would possibly more so than you would when you're working together in one room. So how you make the team feel is more important than how the team or but the client feels. What about the element of <coughs> um, the task being complete? So for example, one of the things that can happen when you're working from home, oh, I'll take a break, oh, I'll watch a half an hour of Netflix, or yeah. oh, I'll go do this chore and come back and do the yeah. work. Would such things happen? And they how would, would you happen. handle them? They would totally happen. But the important thing is, we anticipated that to happen, and we made it an open secret. 
like, do you want to pop over to the grocery store? Go ahead. Just give us a heads up so there's somebody else to cover it. Mm -hmm. You want to go, your kids being dropped off by the bus, bus around the corner, bus is late, go ahead. So there was an actual open forum where somebody would say, you know what, I think I need a break. I need to go watch some TV. Go watch some TV. Because I will not stop you from doing that. If you are stressed and sitting at your desk, you're completely unproductive and you're stressed and I would rather not have a stressed person in, in the team. Do you want to shut down? Put your out of office, let your team leader know. Go watch your TV. So it is, you've got to treat them as adults. And when you bring in a culture like this, you'd be surprised how people actually take ownership of their roles. There is very little to hide because we have never, never ever said, don't do something. You want to go, go. You want to take two days off, go. Shut that laptop, don't show your face, go. And that just brought out the best in people to say, I'm fine, I'll be back in half an hour, leave that job with me, I'll come and finish it. So performance management was just by the by. I think the human element uh, it is. is what matters to get That's the best the of the... That's the only thing that matters. And the more we treat our people like... We don't even treat students like that in school these days. School isn't what it used to be when we were in school. So why would you then treat your team like that? Because they're part of the company. They, as The company is as much theirs as it's yours. So, yeah. It was, it was quite a wonderful, wonderful feeling when that was validated for us. So how did Dare to Scale happen then? So informally, I've been coaching for a very long time now. <coughs> and you started with the salon coaching business. That's when you realized the love for coaching or something? Yes, that is actually true. Because I, it, I didn't realize how much I, I love coaching, I love training, I love teaching, I love advising much, much more than the actual doing. I'm very much the starter in, the, in that scenario. So while I was doing all this, I also realized that one of the things that I want to do is to go back to how my life started and see what I can do for that tired, stressed, feeling alone entrepreneur to change that person's life. Because I kept looking back at my parent, parents, and realized there is a lot of stress, and if only we lived in a culture where you could ask for help. Back in those days in India, you didn't. And even today, in most family businesses, you don't ask for help because that shows vulnerability. So my parents didn't ask for help. When you say ask for help, you mean having mentors and coaches and yes. support? Yeah. You say something's not going right in my business. Somebody tell me, give me an outside perspective. I so agree with you. I mean, it's, I understand it's in our gene. Say, for example, you come from yeah. family business and everything, but it brings in a lot of stress. It does. And uh, because you as an entrepreneur, especially when you're small and you're starting to become bigger or, you know, yes. you're scaling, you're wearing all the hats. You're also the HR, Always. you're also the operations. You're also the CEO, you're also the sales. You are everything. And you have all of these things on your table. That is what it is. And in most cases, the team looks at you for, re for reference, for guidance, for because leadership. Because you are the leader. <laughs> and at no point can you show any of those thoughts that you're looking to hide to your team or to your clients or to your suppliers or anybody. Keep the big, strong face. You and are continue. the big, strong face. You are the brand. You are you are the head of the company. I think that's what is called having the stomach of the... Like having yes. that... Yes, you have the guts to... That's to do it. That's yes, when you... guts to do it. Yeah. At the same time, somewhere, I think we also forget that we're human. Absolutely. And we all need help. And it's perfectly okay to ask for help. Because I, help is always available. Absolutely. I totally believe in mentors and coaching yeah. because <clears throat> you cannot... You only can go that far alone, whether it's without a team or without yeah. a coach or a guide or a training or a mentor... Absolutely believe this it because is. you don't know everything. No, and it's impossible to think that we must know everything. Henry Ford famously has said when asked, well, how come your 
running anything because you you have no idea how to make a car or run a company. He says, no, but I have a phone and I know exactly which number to press to call the greatest <laughs> guidance. <laughs> as long like as you know that you have expertise at your fingertips, then you got it. Because most of us just need that. So tell me about Varsha's biggest strength and biggest weakness. So what was your strength in your business and where did you need help? And what help did you get? My biggest strength is strategy. For me, there are three areas in business, strategy, marketing, and economics. They're all a mind game, all three. Mm -hmm. And that I'm really good at. And I love business, the, the structure, the nuances, this, the strategy of business. I am useless, completely useless at then executing and making it happen for the rest of my life. <laughs> I really am not. So you need I'm someone for operations and execution. I totally did. So guess what? My first hire and my forever friend who is now working with me for so long and is my friend. She's one of the greatest operations head ever. And I thought, well, that's the one I need as a compliment to me. My husband works with me. He's a finance guy. He's a very strong corporate finance guy. Eventually, I got him on the dark side. And I said, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, business is growing. I need somebody to manage that. So he came in. So it is. it really is about, and I'm glad you asked this, because while it's our business, while we know we must know what's happening in our business, we must also understand that it's okay not to be great at everything and bringing in complementary skills. If we are the smartest people in the room, then we're in the wrong room. And that's equally true in your own business as well. Get smart people who are great at what they do because they are the ones collectively who is going to take your business forward. But what if the smart people come at a big cost and you are a startup or a small business and you cannot afford such smart people? Then what do you do? That's where advisors come in. <laughs> <laughs> That's where boards come in. Do you know how few family businesses actually set up family or advisory boards? Because family businesses are not built like that. Family businesses rarely open doors for anybody external. And yet, there is strength in setting up advisory boards. That's one of the things I do, help family businesses set up boards. Because there are, and whether it is a startup, it's the same scenario. You can have your own independent advisory board on your side, like your guides on the side, who you can turn to and say, well, this is happening. I'm not looking to hire you because they are, that's your advisory board. But then do you pay to that? You do pay to them, right? You or do they pay are, are them. They, these are friends and family? Or they these could are be friends and... I would rather not friends and family. Okay. These are subject matter experts. These are people who do this for a living. And there are people who will do this for a living who will be part of your board. And... But does this apply only to family business? So this is any no, business. This is any, any business. business can have an advisory board. Absolutely. And every business must have an advisory board. So if I want an advisory board, what yeah. do I need to do? You get specific areas, which is you get a legal person, a finance management finance person, business strategist, a strong marketer, corporate governance, and possibly an operations professional but again like these all people will come at huge cost no they won't not as an advisor they're not sitting in your office eight hours a day working with you you're only meeting them maybe once a month or maybe even once a quarter to say these are some of the the objectives for this year this is how it's broken down you tell me what i should be doing in which area of my business and how do you find these advisors you come and talk to me <laughs> <laughs> oh, well said but there are there are a lot of professionals now who are perfectly happy to come on an ad, at an advisory level. And is there a, what kind of remuneration? Like, how do we reciprocate? It completely depends on what stage of the business is, on who are some of the advisors that they are, you're bringing in. Do it they ask go, for profit share or is it monthly it fees? It could, again, depends on which who the advisors are, what's, what level of advisory board are you setting up? What level of engagement do you need from them? 
So it could be profit share. Profit share is fairly rare, though. It's a flat fee. Okay. And it's it can be just as affordable as you want it to be. But the good thing is, help is always available. And that's why I started Dare to Scale, to say that has always been one of the things to make sure that no other entrepreneur's life has changed the way my parents and mine changed. Will I go back and change a single day in my life? I wouldn't. Because I am who I am because the life turned out to be like that. But it probably would have been nicer if my, my parents had that support. So that's why I thought, well, if there is one entrepreneur's life I make a difference to in one year, I think that's that's a great step forward. So you're managing multiple businesses again. You have yes. Dare to Scale and you have the other yes. management consultancy. I do, I do. Along and and very specifically within uh, Dare to Scale, we have we support smaller businesses, but we mainly focus on larger family family run businesses, particularly in this part of the world. So coming to the family business dynamics yeah. that you just shared, what are the biggest challenges? related to this family business dynamics when moving to the next generation? There are a few highlights that I will talk about. I'm so glad you asked this. So few people talk about family businesses and succession planning. One, going back to the drawing board for a thorough strategy redrawing. To, so the business got here by the sheer will, blood, sweat, and tears of the original founder. Now, to hand it over and not just change in leadership, but over time, almost your entire, you know, like the human body at some point over the, over the course of a decade, literally every cell is changed. Similar situations happen in larger companies as well. So to prepare for that, a strong strategy development, strong succession planning development, digital disruption, corporate governance, and the ability to understand that having a family constitution is supremely important it's to know that who plays a role in the business from people within the family. Simplifying ownership structures, because suddenly the ownership structure expands to a, to a place where everybody has a say in the business. And eventually, everybody within the family, of course, it's their business, so they would want to say in it, without realizing that what the family wants is may not be what the business needs. Because now, the company has grown to two, three, four hundred, five thousand people. The business's needs are now very, very different. So that corporate governance, having a family office set up so the family's needs are looked after, separating family from family foundation from that and the business is key over there. Getting external leadership, growing within the ranks, managing wealth building activities within your business so that reinvestment happens, building up talent within the company. You know, we work with some of the companies where the, the team's second generation is now back in the company. So the companies have been around for so long. Wow. So, it, so there's a lot of mechanisms that go into it, but predominantly to be able to separate now what the family wants and what the business's needs are. All this is happening while the founder is still very much there and part very of the much business. There. Yes. When is the right time to start thinking about succession planning? From the day you get your trade license. From the day I start my business? Yes. But I'm still starting the business and trying to make it work. Yes. <laughs> and I think and of I'm, the I'm exit. Just, I'm just going to say it as it is. You get hit by a bus tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's something nobody thinks about, right? No, and we don't want to think about it. But then you have your wills and stuff where you, yes. you have a will and if yes. you have enough assets. And, and that takes care of you and your assets. What about the team and their salaries? What about ongoing projects? What about the impact that you have created within the local econo economy? What we don't realize is the minute we start, at, you get your trade license and you start trading, 
in one way or the other, you're contributing to the local economy. Absolutely. The success of your business eventually, even if it is by a few drops, leads to the success of the local economy. And as business owners, we've got to start thinking that big. So the impact you're creating, the legacy you're creating, must last well beyond you. So when is the right time to start? When you get your trade license. It's like, now I'm setting this up. Now I'm going to build a credibility in the market where clients are going to start depending on the services that I offer. But so what's the percentage of the businesses surviving one year, two year, five year periods? Does it matter? Because if, for example, just hypothetical situation, yeah. a business starts, mm -hmm. it's one year, two year, three year, you either yeah. exit, you sell the business, yeah. or something happens, you shut down the business. Yeah. Then if I have done and why enough... why would you shut down the business? For whatever X, Y, Z reason, say your health exactly. has something has happened in the health. Exactly. And then you want to just shut it down. Exactly. So but then why do I need that succession planning? You need that so you don't have to shut down the business. Because shutting down a business is easy, but the impact that is created in the losses is immeasurable. So something happens and the business doesn't work and you shut down the business. But when you start looking at, looking at beyond a product that you are selling through the medium of business, you begin to realize that starting a business is high impact. You start a business for the long term. You don't start a business so I can run it for a couple of years and test how the product works and then maybe sell it and exit. If there's a buyer and you sell and exit, great. What happens to the succession planning, all the investment in time that gone into that? And that's why you sell the business. So let me, let me break this down for you. I see where you're going with this. Succession planning doesn't necessarily always mean giving it, handing it over to the next generation. Succession planning is where exit is easy without impacting the business. So even if you choose to sell it, the buyer can get the business in their hands and be able to run it at least for the first six months to a year without any impact on the business. The same flow and stuff. So that it gives the buyer a breathing space to be able to reestablish their own credibility within the market and then implement their strategy to see how it goes forward. Right. So succession planning doesn't necessarily mean handing it over to somebody within the family. It really is to see, can this business run independently of me or making it process dependent as opposed to people only dependent? Yeah. Does that make sense now? It makes sense. So it doesn't matter whether you're selling the business or you want to shut it down. If that's what your intention is, set that intention right from the beginning. I'm going to run this for three years for this specific purpose, then I'm going to shut it down. Shut it down, and that is also a wonderfully drawn out process. By the way, I don't know if I ever told you, I'm also an exit advisor. Mm -hmm. So people who want to sell their businesses, most people know that oh, we got to build this to sell, but when the actual time comes, we have no idea on how to negotiate deals. We have no idea how the entire handover protocol works. We have no idea how to manage your team to say, okay, the business is sold, you now report to these people. So how does that entire scenario happen? It's, a, it's, it's an art form, if you will. Yeah. So having an exit strategy, you need a guide, you need a coach, yes, you need someone exactly. to have been actually researching. Not yes. that I want to exit anything, but there's a lot of education around nowadays it for is. exiting if you want like to exit it. There are a couple there of books is. also, very popular books. Uh, so many books have been written, written now. on this. And yet when it, when it actually comes down to suddenly reading contracts and reading, never mind reading that, what do you do when you get your first offer? How do you take it from there? So... That is a topic is. on totally uh, a on different, a, on a a different episode. Maybe level, we should do yes. on exiting a business uh, <laughs> but yes, exit strategy for a business Succession planning, whether it is... And why do we then say, um, I start a business and then I want to shut it in two years. Why would I need succession planning? Which should family businesses only look for succession planning? You're a person. Uh, sorry, I'm a person? Yeah. 
So why would you not call this a family business? You may not necessarily have your entire family involved in this. At some point, every business started with one person mm. starting a business. But you should have, um, like in my mind, until now, was succession yeah. planning is basically the family, the, the owner, like it's a father or mother, who has a business yeah. comes to the children. But yeah. it's beyond that. I've understood that. It's not yes. just about the children. It's also um, other, you know, uh, People can come in and exactly. take charge and still exactly. grow your legacy. And I've you been bet. actually and working what on that. What if none of the children want the part of the exactly. business? Exactly, that's another. Because now most most younger generation think, well, I want to start my own startup. I everybody has their own dreams, and what if they don't want to be dreams. part of the? There are there yeah. are there are a lot of dare I say unglamorous businesses in the world, like running a printing shop, for example. It's been going on for a while. Somebody else might think, well, another younger generation might come and say, well, that's not glamorous enough for me. I don't want to do this. Mom and dad, do something else with it. So you've got to grow talent within. Set up the business in a way where you are able to bring in a CEO. You are able to grow somebody to the CEO, rank of a CEO from within. So that is succession planning. One way or the other, there are only two, three things you can do with a business. Close it, sell it, run it to the ground or oh, leave it legacy. running and then you die and then yeah. you don't care what happens to the business but in every scenario please have a plan <laughs> <laughs> moving further with this yes. you are a coach to a lot of uh, different business groups like uh, I female fusion yeah. you have on eoa yeah, which so. is entrepreneur organization accelerator and you do regular training for startups and small yes, businesses i do what is one big challenge you see with these businesses what are they all what is all in common in all of them what are they struggling first with all of them first and foremost they are wonderful professionals who have a great product to offer and that's where the inspiration to start a business comes from not realizing that in many cases we're not running a business we're probably running a practice like a consultancy because if you don't show up to work, you're not making any money. And we today live in this wonderful world where we feel, if I have a trade license, I'm running a business. Are you really free enough from the business? Do you understand business for what it is? And I, I know every time somebody will listen to this podcast, the people who know me will be giggling. Because when you know how to run a business, then it doesn't matter whether you're selling this pair of glasses or that mobile phone. Learn how to run a business. Most people don't know how to run a business, what the difference is. So that's where the entire training actually starts. It's like get to understand what business is and then sell your products. Then see how your own strength, your own credibility raises from like 10x literally. And the other thing that thankfully I'm seeing less of is a lot of people, somewhere in the last decade, we seem to have over social media created this thing called, I want to be my own boss, so I'm going to start my business. And the first time I heard that, I, I didn't even understand what that meant. And I said, why would you start your own, own business if you want to be your own boss? Because there is no such thing as being your own boss when you when you start your business. Basically a full-time, I think a 24-7 employee then that versus exactly a 9 to 5. Because you're answerable to your clients, you're answerable to your people, you're answerable to your suppliers, you're answerable to the market, you're answerable to the government entity that your business is registered in. Tell me one person who will not hold you accountable for your actions, your words, anything. There is no such thing as being your own boss when you start a business. And that's where, when that reality starts to hit in, is where the disillusionment comes in. And that's where the, the training restarts to say, okay, let's start talking again. So what is this one thing, uh, if somebody is thinking of starting their own business, what questions they should be asking themselves to, to know if they are ready for it? Know why you're starting your business. Is it because you would rather not have a job and want that little bit of freedom from the job? 
Or are you now ready to say, I've done this enough, I've gained a lot of experience, independently as a consultant, I think I can make a bigger impact? Or are you here to say, this looks like a great market opportunity, I want to be in, grab the opportunity, and at some point look to exit? So know exactly why you want to start a business. Write down your strategy. Strategy is, for a lot of people, strategy is, uh, is just a big word. But the more you focus on strategy, the better your first three years are going to be. And you cross your first three years, the next two years will be much easier, and then you pass your first five years, your life will be so much more happier as a business owner. Maybe there should be a session on strategy, a business, how to have a business I strategy. I would love to do that because it is <laughs> very few people talk about business strategy. Yeah. So it's about how do you have your team structure, how do about you your SOPs, everything. about your... Um, everything. How are you differentiating yourself from the other players in the market? How are you going to stand out as an independent, credible player in the market? And that's where strategy starts. And... I think that's where it also comes into play uh, back to coaching. Mm -hmm. You have so many degrees and certifications. When I was going through your profile <laughs> and I'm going on reading about your different <laughs> certifications, like you invest so much in your learning. Yes. One, do you need so like do does one yes. need so many? This is I guess it's your interest. You want to learn all these different aspects of business. Yes. And the skills that you've got certifications for. So I have a question for you. One Tell us more about how important it is to invest in training. That is my first question. And second is, which of all the trainings that you have done that an entrepreneur or a business owner must have? So, must how, do. Have is the wrong word. Must do. Must take for themselves. Sorry. How important is it to invest in your own trainings, your own upskilling? More important than you would invest in your business to begin with, upskilling yourself, knowing that every single day you've got to be, not just upskill yourself to be on top of the market, but upskill yourself so that you are the best at what I do, what you do within your field. So it's no longer okay to say, I have a product because literally two months down the line, there'll be somebody else smarter and more efficient at what you do than you are. So whatever business you start, learn everything that you need to learn about the business, about that field, about that profession. Two, two ways to look at this. The first time I heard about that was from my mom. And she says, no matter what business you start, Russia, you must know everything about it. So that tomorrow, if nobody, none of your people show up in your business, you should be able to roll up your sleeves and say, I'm ready. I can deliver this. And you can build it from ground up again. So don't ever be complacent about knowing what you know and then say, well, surely that should be enough. Because every single day, the world is moving at a speed which you can't even fathom. So and if you're not moving with it, in about five seconds, you're left so far behind, you'll constantly be trying to catch up. So how are you going to establish yourself as, as a leading player in the industry if you don't upskill yourself? And conversely, what example are you setting for your team if you don't constantly be on the path of upskilling? So upskilling yourself, investment in yourself is paramount to no matter what you do. Namita, you... We were having a chat before um, starting the recording today. What is one thing that you said? You are constantly upskilling yourself so you are a better interviewer. <laughs> for the purpose of the show, I have invested exactly. in a lot of training for myself. Ex see? In uh, learning how to interview, yes. how to do the research on the guest, what kind of questions to ask. Yes. So many things, how to think about your... But at the end of the day, I'm making the show, of course... I learn a lot, but at the, who are the listeners have to benefit from their time and that they spend watching or listening to the show. And how beautifully you've summarized the purpose of running this show. Because eventually, you, the consumers, your audience, are the ones who you're running this show for. 
and you want them to get the best of it. So you've got to upskill yourself first. True. So yes, <laughs> definitely upskilling yourself. It comes first. And out of all the certificate certifications and all the trainings, what is the one thing that most business owners I would personally recommend? Get to know everything about one of the reasons why I went and got myself NLP master certification is everything in business, it's about people. And you've got to be aware and understand how the brain works, how people work, how experiences show up in different ways to be able to read people. So the more you know about the mind game, the better you are at business. So invest yourself in understanding people better. Because it's all about people, right? Everything you're selling to people, people, you're hiring people, you're managing your team. There's also people. Everything is about people. I know the world is at a rapid rate moving towards AI, and AI seems to be the, the greatest thing on earth. Absolutely it is. But we still are close to 8 billion people on this planet. There's no escaping that. Eventually, we are running a business for them. We show up in the world for people. So the more you know people, the better you get at being a better person yourself. True. Relationships. Yeah. relationships. These are all relationships, whether it it's personal or work. Completely. It's all about relationships. Completely. You show up as the best person, the best people will stand with you. If someone wants to dare to scale and <laughs> wants to work with Varsha, how can they work with you and reach out to you? I'm on LinkedIn. The best platform to get in touch with me. Drop me a hello and... You will always get a to response. LinkedIn her, Varsha Joshi. Yes, LinkedIn. And we'll be adding all the links in the show notes below for Varsha and all her websites and social Thank profiles. You. Varsha, it has, it has been a pleasure Thank talking you so to you, much. like always. Me and Varsha always have these, uh, not always, we started doing these yes. no agenda coffees. And um, those, those, have, those are very deep, amazing conversations. And from there, it has led to this podcast as well. That's exactly what it is, isn't it? So no agenda you, conversation. We can, we can have all the questions, but the <laughs> minute we sit down for a no agenda conversation, some brilliant, brilliant stuff comes out of it. Yeah. Eventually, it's to get to know each other. Absolutely. So thank you so much for, for inviting me, for having such an engaged conversation. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for thank your time. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did and learned quite a few interesting insights on succession planning and investing in your own training. Be sure to like and subscribe to the episodes, to the show. Until next time.